Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All, right. All right. You know, organizing liberals is a hard thing, and no, not everybody's in the seats, but let's, uh, let's get started. I'm Roger Hickey. My pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to our 2013 Gala Awards. Since 2010, when the Congress was taken over by a bunch of crazy conservatives, because the Democrats really had no jobs plan to offer the people, our country has been paralyzed by right-wing extremism and obstructionism, uh, obstructionism. But today, the vast majority of Americans, I'm here to say, have rejected the Tea Party extremists. They're rejecting their self-appointed leaders and all of their works and their destructive attempts to destroy our society and the economy. And Americans are also rejecting the Wall Street extremists who want to cut Social Security and Medicare and impose austerity on all of us. So we at CAF are very proud to have played a big role in exposing how this right-wing ideology has damaged our weak economy and hurt American families. So the challenge before us is to put forward a populist program of jobs and economic opportunity that can bring Americans together. And yesterday, we demonstrated that right-wing extremism can be defeated. And as we saw in New York, progressive economic policy, populism can win big in elections. Tonight, we're honoring three leaders of the new populist movement. Their accomplishments inspire us and show us how to rally Americans for change. I want to thank you all for being here. I have a whole group of people to thank, and we want to acknowledge some of the leaders who are in the audience right now. But we've lost a little time, so I'm not going to read people's names right now. Instead, I want to thank you all. I want to thank the Campaign for America's Future staff for getting us all in these seats. Yeah. And I want to thank uh, Local 25 of HERE for serving us tonight. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our MC for the night. Our Master of Ceremonies is a comedian and an author. You've seen her on TV, and almost every weekend, she's a panelist on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. She's been a published columnist for Mother Jones and an author. And she's so damn smart and funny that she's become a legend in the world of comedy. Please welcome Paula Poundstone. Thank you very much, Roger. I'll bet you, you know, you said you weren't going to list the names. I'll bet you there's not a person in this room that hasn't been thanked or honored at one event or another. Uh, am I wrong? <laughs> Has anybody been missed? Did you, did you applaud? Were you not thanked and honored? Because tonight is your special night. <laughs> what, um, no, wait, isn't that one of the honorees right there? And yet you are complaining that you haven't yet been honored? I have teenagers, sir. I'm used to that kind of attitude. Um, uh, anyways, it, it's, it's so nice to be here. I feel sort of like an idiot. Roger said to me, and right after a, a big election, it's a great night uh, for comedy, and I had to confess that I had paid no attention. Uh, I was glad to hear the good news. Um, but, you know, I, I catch bits and pieces. I'm, I'm frankly not as active as many of you activists. I'm grateful for your work. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I, there are times where I'm really clued into what's happening, uh, and there are times uh, that I, I don't know as much as I probably should. Uh, I, for example, when the Tea Party first surfaced, um, I was really incensed that a group would take the name of a beloved revolutionary group like that. It, it just struck me as arrogant, you, you know. Uh, and then I realized, after I heard them for a while, they might not have meant that tea party. <laughs> they might have meant the Mad Hatter one. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a bit of Ted Cruz uh, in his filibuster, um, and the irony of him reading from Green Eggs and Ham, 
which is the story of a character that didn't want to try something and then did and found that he liked it very much. <laughs> Ted Cruz didn't understand green eggs and ham. A little bit frightening. Um, there wasn't a lot of reading between the lines that you had to do in that text. Uh, anyways, um, now I get to, uh, I, I really uh, suck as an MC, but I didn't tell that to Roger when they first asked me. Uh, because I have OCD, o obsessive compulsive disorder. Everyone has it, by the way. It, it, it won't be covered no matter what health plan we have. Uh, but uh, everyone has it. It's only diagnosed based on the degree to which it interrupts your life. Uh, and in fact, it manifests itself differently in different people, so a lot of people don't even realize they have it. Uh, people think of it as the hand-washing Jones. Mercifully, I do not have that. Uh, the cleaning Jones, which I do have. Uh, uh, some people count their teeth with their tongue. There's door checkers. There's sto stove checkers. That song that gets stuck in your head, that's OCD. I've had Billy Don't Be a Hero for 40-something years. <laughs> you don't necessarily get to choose the quality of the song. Uh, for me, what happens is that uh, I cannot stop talking to save my life. Uh, because what happens is that everything that gets said reminds me of something else that I feel that I must say. And it could be something you said, and then I'll cut you off and say the thing that it reminds me of, or it can be something that I said that reminds me of one more thing that I must say. I'm telling you, Martin Luther King could come to my hotel room tonight and say, I had a dream, and I'd say, oh, I had one too, only in mine. <laughs> so it makes me not a great uh, MC, but, uh, but the first guy I got to introduce, uh, I met um, at another function uh, not too long ago where he was honored and thanked, and uh, sorry, sir. <laughs> is, it, is this really your first time being honored and thanked? It's the Bob guy, isn't it? Bob? Bob, are you frightened right now? <laughs> These are liberals, Bob. We're free-wheeling people. Uh, have you been honored and thanked before, Bob? And, and uh, where? <laughs> Did you say move the program along? All right, I'm with you, Roger. Uh, all right, anyways, I get to introduce uh, somebody who works with Newt Gingrich. I know. You know, he was a historian uh, for Freddie Mac. Did you know that? He was paid between six and eight million to be a historian for Freddie Mac. Who knows how that looked? Uh, apparently what happened was they would have meetings at the big boardroom tables and they'd go, oh my God, we've given mortgages to people who can't afford to pay them back. We're, uh, uh, and we're about to bring down, those have been sold in little bits around the world. Now we're about to bring down the entire world economy. Newt, could you tell us a little something about the pilgrims? <laughs> Imagine working with that guy. Ladies and gentlemen, now to present our first award. Oh, we're not even presenting an award to this guy. I got it all screwed up. To present our first award, the Progressive Champion Award, which I believe Bob will call you. Uh, I want to introduce a man who wears many progressive hats. As a green jobs advocate, an attorney, an author, a civil rights activist, he founded the Rebuild the Dream campaign, and every week he takes that progressive vision into the lion's den of CNN's crossfire, debating with former Freddie Mac <laughs> <laughs> historian, Newt Gingrich. Please welcome Van Jones, ladies and gentlemen. Never mind. <laughs> um, I, I know we're behind, so I want Roger yelling at me. I always just go ahead with my part. Um, first of all, it's just really good to be here, and it's really good to be here for uh, my hero, uh, my friend, uh, somebody who has been there for me personally uh, in good times and bad, uh, Leo Girard. Give him a round of applause just at the mention of his name. Um, You know, the big challenge that we have uh, with all the economic crisis, with the ecological crisis, with the spiritual crisis, with the 
moral crisis is to, we have to make a decision in the face of crisis, are we gonna turn to each other or on each other? That's it, it's pretty simple. Tea Party says turn on each other. Uh, everybody's on their own, it's all about the you know, individuals and you have some people uh, who have become the global icons of what it means when we turn to each other. And what Leo Girard has been able to do, uh, first of all, inside the labor movement, by helping different labor groups come together, he's built uh, the biggest industrial union uh, that we have on, on this half of the planet. Uh, and he's done it with skill, he's done it with determination and integrity. He's gone beyond the labor movement and he's reached out to the environmental movement uh, we've always been pit against each other, environmentalists versus labor. Uh, he's been the most effective labor leader at bringing us together in the Blue-Green Alliance to try to get green jobs and clean energy jobs here in the United States. And he's even gone beyond that. When he realized that the dream of green jobs was being stolen by illegal tactics from our friends in China, and nobody was doing anything about it, we were watching these jobs go away. He led the charge uh, at the federal government level all the way to the WTO and stood up uh, for good labor practices, for fair labor practices, and got China to stop spending millions of dollars stealing jobs here and became a global hero for, for green jobs for everybody, not just for one country. Leo Girard is a hero. He's a hero in the labor movement. He's a hero in the environmental movement. And I am proud to bring him up here to give him his award as a progressive champion. Uh, but first, let's see this video about him. We got a cool video I want you guys to see first. Leo has been out there for a long, long time. Uh, doing something pretty terrific. He is himself a man of boundless energy, impressing for the activism essential for building a more progressive society and a cleaner and more humane world. We represent the voices of ordinary people. I grew up in a, in a union household where my dad uh, made... There's polls that are done that if workers were allowed to choose freely to join a union. Almost 60% of them would today join a union. The reason the opposition is so great is because it, what we see by the lack of unionization is workers haven't been able to get their share of the wealth that they've been creating in our society. Workers organize workers. Workers get together and they decide they want a union. That's who organizes the union most of the time. The organizer is the facilitator. And our job is to create the environment where they have the facts and they have the knowledge and they make an honest decision that they want a union. And once that's been done, what is a, what is a greater vote than putting my name on a card? signing my name and saying, I want this union. Our union held its first conference on what was then called pollution abatement in the middle 60s. Our union led the fight to reduce coke oven emissions. Our union led the fight to remove lead from the workplaces and fight for a lead standard in the 60s and 70s. We fought for a benzene standard. We joined the fight for the banning of asbestos and the elimination from our workplaces. We fought to remove acid rain in my hometown, which was the largest single polluter in North America. For all my years growing up, the mining company would say, well, you, you gotta have a choice between these good jobs and a little bit of pollution. The reality is we didn't have to have the choice. We're either gonna have both a clean environment and good jobs, or in the long run, we'll have neither. We are proud to present America, uh, America's Future Progressive Champion Award to Leo R. Girard for his extraordinary accomplishments and achievements. Please come up here and get your award, sir.
Leo Girard. Well, I told Van when we wouldn't let go of each other that uh, I should probably say thank you very much. I'm going home now. But uh, I, uh, I couldn't help but think if my uh, mom and dad were here, uh, my mom would have been really proud and my dad might have believed half that stuff. <laughs> but let, let me uh, thank the campaign for the tremendous work that they do and the struggle that they make every day to make sure that the real information and the real facts get out so that activists, those of us who want to fight the good fight for a better future, the campaign provides that information, does that kind of work, and they do that, uh, I think, in a way that is very, very beneficial to what we all try to do as activists, and I think we ought to give the campaign a big hand, Roger and Bob. And I, and I do want to say a couple of words about uh, the myth. And one of the things that happens in our society, as Van said, they try to pit us one against the other over all kinds of various issues. And nothing has been more successful the longest period of time of pitting environmentalists against trade unionists or environmentalists against workers and continue to try to make that false dichotomy that you had to decide that you're either going to have, quote, good jobs or a clean environment. And I learned growing up in my hometown that it's not a choice of either or. It's that you're going to have both or neither. And when we talk about we've created the Blue-Green Alliance, there's a person who I know is not in this room who really deserves a lot of record and a lot of recognition for that, and that's Carl Pope, who was the head of the Sierra Club at the time that we created the Blue-Green Alliance. When we created the Blue-Green Alliance, we had a press announcement at the National Press Club. Uh, <laughs> Carl showed up, I showed up, Dave Foster showed up, and about three drunken journalists that didn't know where they were. <laughs> I'm proud to tell you that almost six years later, the Blue-Green Alliance through our affiliate organizations now represents almost 15 million people. <laughs> and, and we have to come to grips with the reality that there's not any one progressive group that are on their own could turn back the right-wing tide that has been sweeping the nation and that has really been pushed. And I was thinking about it last night when I was in uh, Tyson's Corners waiting for the results from that way too close election. I couldn't, I couldn't help but remember seeing Ronald Reagan on television saying government's not the solution, government's the problem. And that might be okay if you're rich. You can send your kids to the private school, you have your private police, you have your private everything. But I'll tell you what, poor people and working people need a government, they need regulations, and they need national health care. And I think about, and again, I want to pay tribute to the campaign because I don't think anyone did greater work when Social Security was under attack and Roger and Bob mobilized the troops and mobilized all of us progressives to go fight against so the Social Security destruction. And I say to myself quite often, are we asking for too much? Are we asking that decent wages are too much? Are we asking that after you've worked a lifetime that you're able to retire with some dignity, that you don't have to cut your pills in half, that you retire with some decent health care, that you can have the autumn years of your life where you don't have to worry about being kicked out of your home if you get sick? I don't think we're asking for too much. But I actually believe if we don't come together as progressives, and put our egos behind us, put our institutional egos and our personal egos behind us and decide that this fight isn't just for us. This fight of the kind of society we want is for our kids and grandkids. I don't want my legacy that my grandkids have a lesser life than I've had and I believe those fights are important and we need to fight together so that our kids have a good life and our grandkids have a better life than we had. That has to be our mission. So I know that Roger runs a pretty tight ship, so I'm going to close by saying this. And I say this to all of us. And, and I, before I do that, I want to thank some of the, uh, the vice president of our union, Tom Conway, uh, convinced some of these major corporations that we have pretty good relationships with, uh, convinced them to uh, make a contribution. 
I told Tom, tell them to send the money, but they don't have to come. <laughs> but I'm, pretty, I'm really proud that a couple of them, several of them, have shown up. And I'm really proud that one of them from Dom Tar, I said, I'm going to do some lefty shit here. And he said, that's OK, so I got my car still running. <laughs> so, but I want to acknowledge that they're here and they're supporting our causes. So I'll give them a hand. The, the last thing I want to say is something that I say to our leadership and to our membership as often as I can. The country doesn't have to be this way. This isn't God-given. This wasn't handed down. This isn't the free hand of the market. Everything is designed to be this way. And we don't have to stop to say that we have to win every fight. The fact of the matter is, none of us could promise that we could win every fight. But I can make you this promise. If we don't fight, we're going to lose. And if we don't fight for the kind of future that we want for our kids, don't fight for the kind of future you want. Fight for the kind of future you want your kids and grandkids to have, and then you can't be wrong. So thank you very much to the campaign. Thank you very much to all of you. Three friends from Canada? Is that what you just said? They're in the Parliament. <laughs> Canada. Welcome, Canadians. <laughs> Someone singing the theme song for Canada. I, uh, you know, I, I, I. I we are the only country that Canada hates, so I want to thank you so much for joining us. Oh, they're mad at us all the time. You know, I work in Canada, and I asked the audience, why, are, why don't they like us? And they said, because they have to study our history in school, and we don't know anything about theirs. And you know what? Busted. I said, geez, I've always thought of you as our hat. Oh, they don't like that. <laughs> I feel that, you know, and so I said to the audience when I was there, I said, you know, I work all over the states. Tell me what you want to tell people, and I will say it, you know. Not a word. Dead silence from the Canadians. And you know what? That's their fault. You know, people make fun of us for being boorish, but we put ourselves out there, and there's a fair amount of danger in that. But those Canadians, they're so shy and so retiring. Nothing, not a word from them. Even their theme song, Oh Canada, that's not aggressive enough. <laughs> Are you going back to Canada? Not till Friday? Well, will you tell them, for God's sakes, get out there? <laughs> Why do you, what do you, like, are you, did they say you were part of the parliament? I don't, I don't, oh, um, I've seen you on C-SPAN before. Uh, from the city of Toronto? <laughs> oh, not the city of Toronto. You know what? I, Toronto is a great city. It's a fabulous city. And uh, it's, it, well, you know what? I don't know. I kind of feel for the guy, to be totally honest with you. I mean, I'm glad he's stepped down and, and that. You know, you know what? Here's what America did. I was looking at the CNN website tonight, and there was like one, you know how they have the little bullet point things? Dr. Drew says the t t Toronto mayor may be an alcoholic. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Drew. <laughs> you know, there's another possibility, which is that Dr. Drew is a self-serving prick. That's another possibility. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know, it kind of may, I'll tell you something. I would rather go camping for a month with the mayor of Toronto than even look at Dr. Drew on television. <laughs> you put me in a pumped pup tat with the crackhead, we'll be fine. <laughs> Did that ever occur to Canadians that he might have a problem? Or is that why you're here, to get help from Dr. Drew for the mayor of Toronto? No. You people are wise enough to figure that out on your own. We don't need Dr. Drew mucking everything up. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. 
uh, it's my job at this time, ladies and gentlemen, to intro introduce yet another presenter. Bob, will you wait? <laughs> Our next presenter has been a crusader for change, just like many of you. A few years ago, she rallied her neighbors in the 4th District of Maryland to challenge a guy who was representing them badly in Congress. And she won. Now she has taken her crusade for change into the Congress, where she's focused on improving the lives of working families. Please, please welcome Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Much good evening. So I came out this evening and I thought I had talked to Roger and Bob and I really wanted to introduce Leo Gerard, my hero. I love you, man. I love you. And then they said no. And then I said, well, can I introduce my good friend, my mentor, my shiro, Marge Tabankin? And they said no. And then they said, well, we want you to do another introduction. And I thought about that, and then I said, well, OK, I guess so. Well, it turns out that I have the particular responsibility of introducing our next award winner. And um, I will just say that the award, the Paul and Sheila Wellstone uh, Citizenship, uh, Citizen Leadership Award, is one that is really special to me. I had, like many of you, worked on a lot of political campaigns since I was a teenager, but it wasn't until I heard Paul Wellstone that I wrote the first check that I ever wrote to any political candidate, and it was the $50 that was the best $50 I ever spent on Paul Wellstone. And then when they came to Washington and I got to know and meet and work with Paul and Sheila Wellstone, uh, it was amazing. And even to this day in the Congress, there are so many times when I ask myself, what would Paul Wellstone do? And there are other times when I say, and what would Sheila say about it? <laughs> and so this evening, it really does give me a great pleasure to present a, an award that's uh, in honor of two people whose passion and vision and leadership and energy served us all well and continues to do so. And Reverend Dr. William Barber. Now, I want to tell you another reason I was very excited to do this this evening, because Reverend Dr. Barber, now I do represent the 4th Congressional District of Maryland, but I am from Yanceyville in Caswell County, North Carolina. And so as a native North Carolinian, I was really proud when I saw, like many of you did, his local and his national leadership and the way that he organized. And he's such a humble man. He says, you know what? I didn't do all of that. I had people around me. But that's what a good organizer says. I know Leo knows that. But he organized them in the fight on voting rights and fair redistricting and health care reform and labor and workers' rights, immigrant rights and ed education reform. He's been the leader of the Moral Monday movement. And you know what? He reminded me it is indeed a movement. And it's a movement that you know, is really designed to fight the control of the Republican-led legislature in North Carolina, to reorient it back to the people of North Carolina. And this movement has helped to highlight the public policy decisions that are being made by the crazies that are hurting the poor and the women and children and the members of the LGBT community, the elderly and our veterans. <laughs> Dr. Barber is leading the charge in North Carolina, but we are feeling the charge all across this country. <laughs> Dr. Barber's commitment to service and improving the lives of those around him are really second to none. 
And I am really so inspired by him. And just to tell you what a great organizer he is, he got me to agree just standing over there that I come to North Carolina in February, and I'm going to do that. So tonight, I am so pleased and proud to present to now my favorite North Carolinian, the Paul Wellstone Citizenship Leader Leadership Award to Reverend Dr. William Barber. Please take a look at the video. Revolution. <laughs> we give honor to God tonight and thank him for his spirit and his strength to do the work that has assigned our hands and the moments of life that we have. Let me thank also our representative, my homegirl, uh, for being so gracious tonight. To Roger and Robert, we thank you and the sponsors. To my friends, Rob Schofield and Chris Fitzsimon, who put out North Carolina Policy Watch and have helped bring our work to your attention. To my son, uh, who's here tonight with me, who is uh, soon to be, he was an environmental physicist and wants to major in environmental policy law. I accept this prestigious award on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of people in North Carolina who have been inspired and energized by our Moral Monday Forward Together movement. Many of them, some of them are here tonight. <laughs> this award doesn't belong to me. It belongs to all of the civil disobedient, civilly disobedient, <laughs> black and white, LGBT, straight, Latino, civil rights veterans, labor rights advocates, poor, 
wealthy people of faith, clergy, professors, doctors, students and teachers, young people in North Carolina who have decided to stand up and declare forward together, not one step back. We have, we have decided to do this against the temporary tide of immoral and extreme public policy and the public policy makers. It belongs to our team of local presidents of the NAACP, members of our executive committee, our staff, our team of lawyers, and one of our lead counsel, the Advancement Project, and our social media and video gurus like Fusion Films and Story of America. And it belongs to the more than 160 coalition partners representing more than two million North Carolinians who've been working together in the Forward Together People's Assembly movement for seven years building a 21st century model of fusion politics in the South. We believe that we are in the middle of a third reconstruction, a time of great transformation. We believe the forces of extremism and regressivism understand that a future is coming that, they ca that cannot be denied. We believe that in this moment, in order to change the nation and prepare for the future, we need state-based movements rooted in our deepest constitutional, moral, and religious values that are decidedly anti-racist and anti-poverty that have national implications. Transformative movements always begin from Montgomery up, from Selma up, from Raleigh up, which is why which is why 50 years ago, Dr. King's instructions were so clear to the devotees of civil rights. He said, if you want a new America, don't necessarily come back to Washington, but go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to North Carolina, and build state movements that challenge the injustices in state capitals that have national implications. We believe we must have movements that are not transactional, but transformative where people come together and challenge the policies of extremism in the courtroom, the legislature, the social media, ballot box, and even with civil disobedience. We believe there must be a direct challenge to the so-called moral framework of extremism paid for by Tea Party and Coke money and Art Pope money in New York and New North Carolina, and the ultra-conservative moral framework that says moral issues are limited to praying in the schools and abortion rights and homosexuality. We believe this is both hypocritical and heretical. We believe there must be a direct challenge to this limitation. We must declare without retreat that our constitutional values, establishing justice, promoting the general welfare, the common good, the good of the whole, must be the critique and at the center of every public policy decision. And the moral values, of doing justice and loving mercy and caring for the least of these and lifting the poor and healing the sick and welcoming the stranger and uplifting children and declaring as the prophets of old said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. Or to say like Jesus said, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you visit me? This framework must be at the center of our public policy life. Because within this framework, economic sustainability is a moral issue. Budgets are moral issues. Health care is a moral issue. Living wages is a moral issue. Voting rights is a moral issue. Rights of our immigrants, friends, are moral issues. Women's rights is a moral issue. Treating our LGBT friends with respect and dignity and not hate and disdain is a moral issue. So. We say to our progressive and liberal friends, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It was on the, in the framework of moral issues that we changed this country in the first reconstruction in the 1800s and in the second reconstruction in the 1960s. And we say to those who have for too long tried to hijack and hold hostage the moral and values debate in this country, particularly in the South, that day is over. That day is over. Your actions have been weighed in the balance. We say to the so-called Christian right that is often so wrong, your actions have been weighed in the balance. We love you, but you are not the true conservatives. We are because we want to conserve the essence of faith, and that is love and justice and righteousness and mercy. 
your, we love you, but we must tell you that your limited view of morality have been found wanting because they are morally indefensible, constitutionally inconsistent, and economically insane. So if you want a moral debate in, in America, if you want a moral debate in America, bring it on. We are ready for it. Bring it on. Bring it on. And finally, and finally, we have found in North Carolina that when you build from the ground up a state-based movement with national implication, when we found that when we become a catalyst for discourse, moral discourse that is not rooted in the limited language of liberal versus conservative or Democrat versus Republican, but instead the moral language of what is moral versus immoral, what is extreme versus what is constitutional and just, it brings people together. It creates a new fusion politics. It binds our hearts together it, in ways that are unmistakably powerful. It brings hope. And so I took a moment from the front line to come and accept this award on behalf of all those in the Moral Monday movement. 941 have been arrested. Never before have that many people been arrested challenging the actions, the immoral actions of a state capitol. They said when 17 of us got arrested on April 29th, it wouldn't make a difference. But 30 weeks later, nearly 1,000 have been arrested, thousands have joined, over 1 million hits on social media. Every week, there's another rally in North Carolina. Even out in the mountains, there are rallies, and down east, there are rallies, and in the middle of North Carolina, there are rallies. The governor called us outsiders, but now the governor who was at 60% in the polls when we started is now under 30%. The extreme members of the legislature called us morons and used the tactic of the Mississippi Sovereign Commission with one of their policy groups, Civitas, and put our names and our addresses all over the inter internet. They were around 40% when we started, but now they're under 19%. Mara Monday is polling among all North Carolinians at over 48%. One writer said that our governor is the 18th worst governor in the country, and Mara Monday is one of the top 40 movements in the world. And it's growing every day. And so we are making a call tonight. Tonight, we built from the ground up, but tonight, we want you to join us on February the 8th. All roads lead to North Carolina. Just like they announced for us to come to Selma in the 1960s, we're asking you to join us for a mass moral march on Raleigh February the 8th to send a signal throughout this state and out this country that we are not going backwards. We want you to come and be there with us. Come on down and let's send a signal across the South that a new day is here, a new day of voting, a new day of working together, a new day of standing together, a new day of changing things together. There may be a temporary anomaly in North Carolina, but when the people come together, we have never been defeated. And as we sing at every Moral Monday, if we stay together and stand together, I've got a feeling, I've got a real good feeling that everything is going to be all right. Come on down, let's change this nation. Dr. William J. Barber, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Canadians, are you busy in February? <laughs> you coming? <laughs> All right. All right. Um, what do you have to go back for on Friday? Why don't you just stay? <laughs> it's, you think, yeah, it's cold up there in Canada. It's, it's going to be warmer here. I'm lying to them. Just lying. Uh, it's cold here in the wintertime, honestly. I'm, I know it's cold in Canada as well. It's here with the wind whipping around the bill. It's cold here. I was walking down the street one time in the winter in DC and I realized if Van Gogh had lived here, he never would have had to cut his ear off. He could have just snapped it off. 
Apparently it wasn't really time for a Vincent Van Gogh joke here with the liberals. <laughs> You're artsy, but you gotta time it right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here tonight because I first heard about the great work of the Campaign for America's Future from people I respect, like actor Mike Farrell. And because I've met the amazing Marge Tabankin, who is on the board, and then I got on the CIF's mailing list. You people are busy, busy, busy. I wanted to participate because I have great respect for the people who are standing up to the political crazies who shut down our government and were willing to break the entire world economy in order to make a point. And can anyone really tell what the Tea Party's point is? <laughs> it seems to me the Campaign for America's Future is not just fighting the crazies. They are reminding all of us that we are a majority in our own country. And that if the majority rules, we should be investing in jobs. And we'd be protecting, protecting Social Security and Medicare. And we'd be reminding the politicians that they work for us. Uh, so talk a little more about the campaign. And please welcome, uh, that would be me, uh, please welcome. Bob? <laughs> so talk a little more about the campaign. That would be me talking about the campaign. But why? Bob, who has been itching to get up here all night to a point of obsession, Bob. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't get that last name. <laughs> well, I'm here not to be honored, although it's been a pleasure, <laughs> but to honor you and to thank you for the campaign and for the, its sister institute. I want to thank you for your support, for your commitment, for your leadership. Tonight, your generosity has exceeded all of our expectations and all of our hopes. You set new records. And you've generated, you may have noticed, the thickest tome of love letters since, well, since people used to write love letters. So thank you. Uh, and I want to pay a particular thanks to the talent that helped pull off this event particularly Natalie Shear, Chelsea Hathaway, and Tamara Leopold of Natalie Shear Associates. And my colleagues at the campaign, uh, with a special thanks to the guy who uh, fielded all the spears, dodged all the bullets, and made the thing happen, Roger Hickey. <laughs> Now tonight, the spotlight is on these extraordinary progressive champions. Reverend Barber, you teach us and inspire us, and your voice is heard across this country. <clears throat> Leo Gerard, we are honored to count you as an ally and a friend. You are labor's visionary, and hell, if you hadn't been born in Canada, we'd be drafting you to run for president. And Marge Tabankin, uh, <laughs> that would be a delight to see you take on Ted Cruz. Marge, you're up next. You've been a co-conspirator, a guide, a friend for over three decades. When I think back on it, you have done amazing work, girl. Just amazing work. <clears throat> so a bit about the campaign, we serve as a Strategic Center for Progressive Ideas and Organizing. Our annual conferences, because of your generosity, will continue to bring leaders and activists from across the progressive community to share the ideas, the energy, the strategies like that of Reverend Barber to take back the American dream. When we launched the campaign, Republicans controlled everything in this city. But we beat Bush when he tried to privatize Social Security. <laughs> And we continue to defend, and to defend and try to extend Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid 
and basic security for all Americans. With Leo's help, we helped forge the Apollo Alliance that brought labor and greens together to call on America to lead in the green industrial revolution. And that call has more urgency even today. When Nancy Pelosi became speaker and President Obama took the White House, we helped build the drive for universal health care. And we didn't get everything we wanted. But forget, forget about the objections, the snafus. As we go, these days, over these next months, millions of Americans are going to have access to affordable health care who never had it before. Now we're bringing the heat to education spring as parents and students across the country are defending public schools and demanding at least the basics from pre-K to affordable college for every child so that every child has the opportunity to learn. <clears throat> and we will continue relentlessly to pound on the need for good jobs for making this economy work for working people. We will not accept and we will not put up with what they call the new normal, an economy scarred by mass unemployment, stagnant wages, kids sitting on the couch unable to find a job, where working families sink and the richest few pocket all of the rewards of growth. <laughs> and these days, with all that shit, it's easy to despair. Good jobs are scarce, inequality grows worse, labor is under siege, Wall Street is more concentrated, money politics more suffocating, the right is ever more crazy. But we know, <laughs> we know that a rising majority stands with us on basic bread and butter issues. And we know that the conservative era is bankrupt, it has failed, the big con is over. We can revive the American dream. The ideas are there, the activists are there, the energy is there, the majority is there, the passions are there. It will take a movement. It will take people in motion uh, to force the change, as Reverend Barber has started to demonstrate in North Carolina, as Leo has demonstrated across the country, as Marge to Bankin has helped build through the years. None of us can do this alone. We all must do our part. And for our part, I can tell you that the campaign will stay on the case. And together, together we can and we will rebuild the American dream. <laughs> now, it's my pleasure to introduce a, a great leader of that movement. And I haven't seen her tonight, so I hope she's here. <laughs> <I'm> here. <laughs> <laughs> You all know who she is. Working families have no greater tribune. There is nobody up there who makes more sense and takes less nonsense. She knows how the rules got rigged. She knows what must be done to make them work for working people, and she is not afraid to crack heads. She hasn't been in Washington long, but you know, the agency she conceived and set up, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, has already returned over a billion dollars to consumers from the abuses of credit card companies. She is now the senior senator from Massachusetts. Please welcome the leader of the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, Senator Elizabeth. with so many progressives. Uh, I love it. I really do. I feel like I'm at a family reunion. Uh, I, well, actually, if you knew my family, this is better than a family reunion. 
Um, I want to say thank you very much to Bob and to Roger. Thank you for inviting me here tonight so that I could participate in this event. But most of all, thank you for all you're doing over and over and over for Campaign for America's Future. You are making it one of the leaders in the progressive movement. We need you, and you're out there making it happen. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that's what this really is. This is a movement. All of you here in this room, you are our leaders. You are leaders in your states. You are leaders in your cities and towns. You are leaders in your neighborhoods. You are leaders in your organizations. You are the people who will make this movement happen. You are the ones who will lead us into the future. And so I want to thank you for being here and taking energy when we're all here together. It's powerfully important. So I thought when I had a chance, Bob, Bob raised something that's very important to me, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to get to be here with all of these leaders, I, I thought I'd tell a little story, because I thought it might, it might be fun. And the story is about something Bob mentioned. It's that a few years ago, I had an idea for a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And, thank you. And the idea behind it was really pretty simple. It was that we'd have really a little agency, relatively speaking, that would protect people from the tricks and traps in their credit cards. It would protect them from fraudulent mortgages. It would protect them from getting cheated in little ways and big ways over and over and over. It would stop that. That was the idea. So. So I thought, okay, I've got this idea. It's 2008. We've seen the big financial crisis. We've seen what goes wrong when you can target families. Because make no mistake about understanding the crisis of 2008. It started one lousy mortgage at a time. It started by targeting families and hurting families. That's how it all got started. So my idea was, okay, we're talking about now change. We don't want this crisis to hit us again. So I came down here to Washington. And I didn't know much of how you do this. So I went around. I talked to as many people as I could. And a lot of our friends. I went to see as many as I could. And I told them about this idea for an agency. And almost to a person, they had the same two responses. Different words, but the same two responses. The first was, that is a great idea. You could actually make a real difference in the lives of working families. You could actually do something that makes government work a little better here. You could actually do something that would help level the playing field just a little bit between the giant banks and the ordinary family. That was the first thing they said. The second thing they said was, don't do it. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this, why they always said, don't do it. They said, don't do it because you cannot possibly win. You can't possibly win because the largest financial institutions will make it their number one priority to kill that little agency. And they will put together the largest lobbying force ever assembled on the face of God's green earth to have one goal and that is to make sure that agency does not make it into law. So don't do it because you can't win. Now, I am naive in the ways of Washington. <laughs> so I would hear this, and what I thought people were saying to me was, try harder. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> I read way too many Nancy Drew books growing up, you know, kind of <laughs> intrepid girl policymaker. And so, so I thought, okay, so how do you get this done? If you don't just come talk to the people who actually make law and have it happen that way, how do you get this done? And a friend of mine said, uh, you need to get organized. So I said, great, great, we get organized. So I set up a conference call had two people on it, which I think legally does not qualify as a conference call. <laughs> but two became four, and four became 10, and 10 became 50. 
And then the idea of connecting with groups, with others who were already organized, began to dawn on me. And all I can say every time I think about this consumer agency is God bless the groups that came in. God bless the AFL-CIO. God bless the steel workers. God bless SEIU. God bless AARP. God bless PCCC. God bless Move On. God bless Consumers Union that got out there and got active on this. They did it. And they helped build a movement. It was a movement around financial reform. Leo, you were part of this, you remember. A movement around financial reform and a movement that said we will have this consumer agency. We are not going to come out of this crisis without something that makes it just a little safer for American families. They got in there, they fought for it, and you know the answer. We won. We got the agency people who get tricked on other financial products have got a way to get some redress for it, got a way to get some help. Mortgages, you can't get cheated on a mortgage today the way you got cheated five years ago. Those are real differences, real differences. So let me tell you what I take away from that, because this is what matters. I, I learned two lessons from this thing. The first one is, when people tell me, you can't get anything done in Washington, give up now, there's nothing that can happen, I say back to them, we can win. That's the lesson, we can win. Yep, we got to fight, we got to fight, and look, you don't get anything you don't fight for, but if you fight, you got a chance to win, and that's what we did. So the first thing I learned, we can win, but the second thing I learned is we win because the things we are fighting for are America's agenda. Our agenda is America's agenda. We don't have to get out there and persuade people of things that aren't quite true. Give them some wiring on why it is you're all going to be better off if we just take a little slice out of Social Security. How it is you're all going to do just fine if there's not health care available to you. We're not trying to sell that. What we're doing is we're fighting for the things that Americans want. They know that Wall Street needs tougher rules, stronger enforcement. People know that. When we fight for it, we fight for America's agenda. They know that we need to raise the minimum wage. Anyone see some of those elections yesterday? When we fight for that, people know what we're fighting for. They know that we are here to protect Social Security and Medicare. When we fight for that, we fight for what America wants. People know we need to rebuild our infrastructure. We don't have a country that works if we don't build roads and bridges and power grids and clean energy. People understand that. When we fight for infrastructure, we fight for America's agenda. People believe in equal pay for equal work and a woman's right to choose. When we fight for those, we fight for America's agenda. And I got to say, after today, people believe in equal employment opportunities and equal marriage, and equal means equal. But that is what we have to remember. We're out there fighting for what people want, for what people believe in. We're just the ones who give it voice. And today, I'm here to be able to have the chance to honor a great leader in our progressive movement, a real champion of progressive causes, Marge DeBankin. Now, many of you know Marge as someone who gives who gives time, who gives money, but most of all, who gives energy 
an amazing and seemingly bottomless amount of energy to help progressive causes and to help progressive candidates. That's what Marge does. Marge didn't set out with this in mind. When she was a kid in college, she was beaten as she tried to cover the Vietnam War demonstration at the University of Wisconsin. Her injuries took her to the emergency room, but somehow Marge had the energy to pick up a payphone, call the New York Times, and make sure they got the story of what happened. That's Marge. That's Marge. But with that, her career in journalism was over. Because that day in Wisconsin, Marge decided she didn't want to just cover the news. She wanted to fight to change the news. That's who Marge is. So Marge became the first woman president of the National Student Association. Bless. Anyone? Yep. She was the head of VISTA during the Carter administration. She was, I'm going to have to slow down on these. She was executive director of Hollywood Women's Political Committee. She's been a philanthropist and with the ARCA Foundation, the Streisand Foundation, the Righteous Persons Foundation, she has been out there fighting for progressive causes. And Marge has been doing what we all do, what we all are trying to do. She has organized, organized, organized. Over the years, Marge has helped progressive groups and causes, both international and domestic. She worked to improve conditions in Central America. She stood up for a woman's right to choose. She's helped elect progressive candidates, including first-timers like me. Thank you, Marge. Marge is a devoted family member. She was in her 20s when she returned home for a year to care for her mother before she died for can from cancer. She moved her mother-in-law to Los Angeles, taking her out every Sunday before she passed away. She's been a loving mother to Lauren. She's an adoring grandmother to six-year-old Elliot. I think Marge's mom and dad would be proud of her, happy that she devoted her life to the Jewish value of repairing the world, and delighted that she married activist filmmaker Earl Katz, a healer of the planet. So I wanted to be here tonight to have a chance to thank her personally, not only for her help in my Senate race and the confidence she showed in a first-time candidate, but also for her help with the consumer agency when she gave crucial early support when we were first launching the spark of an idea that became that agency. Marge was there, and I will always, always be grateful. Now, usually, Marge works behind the scenes, supporting people who have visible roles. But tonight, we bring Marge out front and center to say thank you for a lifetime spent fighting for progressive causes. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating the recipient of the America's Future Lifetime Achievement Award, Marge Tabanka. Those of us who have been in the struggle for human rights and civil rights and justice, globally or domestically, have always been blessed by the fact that Marge DeBankin is not only in our ranks, but one of the great voices in our midst. This is a woman who's made an extraordinary contribution to this country. She was very active in the student movement, and later as an advocate and an organizer of uh, young people. She was not the typical bureaucrat that you will see in Washington. I think our movement and much that we have tried to do in the last quarter of a century has been significantly enhanced by what Marge DeBanker has brought to the table. I'm thrilled that tonight the campaign is honoring my longtime collaborator, Marge DeBanker. Our many years of working together have been so meaningful and rewarding to me. Marge, you're not only a close, trusted advisor, but also 
a very close and dear friend. As the director of the Hollywood Women's Political Committee, where we first met in 1987, you harnessed the energy and passion of women in the industry to further a more progressive political agenda. You're always searching for ways to give opportunity to all and leaven the often unequal playing field of American life. Marge, you lead from the heart, but brilliantly support your beliefs with a depth of knowledge that inspires and amazes me. Because of your leadership over the last three decades at the Streisand Foundation, we've had real impact on issues we both care deeply about. I am so excited about our newest pursuit, the establishment of the Women's Heart Center at Cedar sinai uh, Hospital in Los Angeles, to bring much needed awareness of women's heart disease. I hate to think of our country without people like you, Marge, willing to sacrifice for a higher ideal, people who won't take no for an answer when tirelessly pursuing justice. As your friend, uh, I think Tom Hayden once said, Marge is part of a group of people that tried to invent activism as a permanent way of life, and she succeeded. That activism and energy hasn't been used in pursuit of your personal gain, but from a patriotic calling to make our nation live up to its higher ideals. How grateful we all are that you have. I love you, Marge, and I'm really so proud of the work that we've done together over the last, what is it, 26 years. And I look forward to learning from you and laughing with you for many, many more. Congratulations. <laughs>
game, finding the right people can really pay off. Aww. You know, we desperately hope to be able to keep working in a political system that doesn't feel alien and corrupt. And election victories along the way, how sweet they are, sometimes can really lift your spirits. And that's what Elizabeth did for me. So thank you for everything for being here for me tonight, for being here for all of us. And, you know, I'll lick stamps for you. I'll do anything, so just call. <laughs> I don't make that offer to a lot of people. <laughs> um, tonight's very difficult for me because, as Elizabeth said, I, I hate this. I hate being in front of the stage. I hate not being the one telling everybody else what to do. I love telling everybody what to do. But I did it because of who asked, and who asked was the Campaign for America's Future. And after sitting at board meetings with Leo and working for so many years with Bob and Roger, it was pretty hard to not say yes. So um, here I am. Um, what? <laughs> You know, the staff of the campaign does amazing work. They get paid very little, but are relentless advocates for the kitchen table issues that really affect the daily life of every working American and every poor person in this country. Their commitment to a decent job that pays a living wage, to quality medical care, to retirement benefits, to a fair and good education, that doesn't bankrupt America's young people. Thank you, Lauren, for teaching me that. Um, and for recognizing that together we're more powerful than we are when we're separate, and that our main allies we need to be respectful of and partner with in labor who have for so many decades led all of us to a better lifestyle, not just their members, all of us. To Bob and Roger, okay, you guys, you're wonky, but for people like me, you sort of break these really complicated ideas down and you explain what they really mean to real people, and people like me need that. So I am so grateful that I can just call you and ask, okay, so what does this really mean? What is this chain CPI thing? And what, you know, I mean, stay being wonky and stay being able to translate that wonkiness into things that matter in our lives. But I really want to say especially, oh, one diversion. Nothing like following who I had to follow here tonight, huh? <laughs> only, one, only one time in my life was it even worse. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than what we had tonight. Leo, this amazing, I've had a crush on you forever, labor leader. <laughs> and Reverend Barber, who I, I've never been exposed to other than in the media. But years ago, and anybody here who knows David Fenton can tell you this is true, as a student leader, I had to follow Allen Ginsberg reciting Howl <laughs> <laughs> while people were waiting to hear John Lennon and Yoko Ono sing. Sort of, you want to know why I hate this? That's why I hate this. <laughs> By the time you get to this stage in the program, everybody has said everything better than you could ever say it. So for me, it's going to be now personal, because a lot of these notes, everybody has already said already. Thank you to each of you that turned out for me tonight, those of you that were able to be here, and for many of you who sent very generous checks who were not able to be here. 
But honestly, I really am, and everybody else sort of says this, but I truly mean it. I am here representing all of us. You know, a bunch of us in this hall tonight grew up together. We traveled together, we fed each other, we got into stupid fights with each other. We did a lot of things, mostly legal, some not. Um, but we, we really became an extended family, and while Tom jokes about creating activism as a way of life, there are people here that literally it is now 40 years, and we are still together. So for everything we've, we've done together, and for all of us who've known each other, and the generation that I'm talking about, you know who you are. Um, thank you for being on this journey and for bringing me along with you. Really, it, not just for the food and the housing, but not just for the bad romantic decisions, but really for, for right, curing my soul and keeping me together. Uh, like all of us, people have come before us and they have been real mentors. And I know that there were very special people who lit the path for me. And God, it's really strange being old. But these people were there for me when I was really young. And I just like, would, would like to say that part of who I am was because of who took me into their life, who mentored me, who adopted me, essentially, who picked me up when I fell, who yelled at me, who guided me, screamed at me, adored me, um, but never made it easy. And some of those people are Michael Harrington, Saul Alinsky, Tom Hayden, Dick Boone, Les Dunbar, David Hunter, and Bill Dodds. They were pretty amazing teachers. Not easy, very tough, but really there. And found this young woman who came from Newark, Wisconsin, and that, uh, from Newark, New Jersey via Madison, Wisconsin, and landed in Washington, and just took me in, supported me financially, gave me strategic advice, made me crazy with what are you gonna do tomorrow, and if you do this, what's gonna happen, and is that stupid or what? You know, I mean, it's, it was like, it, it, it like was Marine boot camp for an organizer. But I learned so much. Um, and they really did explain that I'm part of a legacy of what went before. And to the young people in this room, I only hope that our generation can be to you what these people were to us. Um, first of all, there are a lot of you here tonight. You are amazing. You are brilliant. You are fun. You are collaborative. You are global in your thinking, and you have that damn tech savvy, which I swear to you, no matter how much I get taught by geek squads, I will never figure out. Thank God I can now do email. Uh, but you guys rock, and you are gonna take that whole history and take it forward to sort of hopefully finish the dreams that my generation started but couldn't quite finish. Um, and I am so grateful that many of you have been personally involved in my life and have laughed with me, giggled with me, helped me when I was down, and really made me look good when I needed it. Um, I'm going to say to you what was said to me, which change doesn't come easy. It doesn't just materialize in the air. It doesn't happen in, you know, by default. We've all heard that, and we all know it, but it is so true. It is a long, long, continuing struggle, and thank God we have had the victories we've had and how sweet they were, because God knows we had a lot of failures, made a lot of mistakes, were really stupid at times, but you know what? We've moved, we've moved forward and women have a right to choose. I'm not paying for underground abortions. <laughs> I mean, 
it's so crazy that when I was at the University of Wisconsin, I was talking long distance to a woman in Chicago who I didn't know, helping on the Underground Railroad with young women in Madison who needed abortions and trying to get them through this woman in Chicago. And then I find out as I'm living in her house for a little bit that it's Heather Booth, you know? I mean, uh, Heather and I are these two people that didn't even know each other and that was us. So, <laughs> so you know, um, I had those people in my life and I just really hope for those young people here and young means anything 20 and up, okay? I learned when the State Department sent me to a conference of young Soviet leaders, they thought young was 55 and up. <laughs> By the time, I mean literally their youth leaders were between 55 and 65. That's who came. I was in pigtails, combat boots, and like a beret on my head, and they showed up with lots of vodka, and they were all between 55 and 65. And I was trying to explain to them the notion of American philanthropy, which was businesses create capital, they make lots of money, and then they give it away. And I'm trying to explain this in Sea Island, Georgia, at the Cloisters Hotel, to a bunch of members of the Soviet Communist Party, right? Okay. So if I could do that, I can stand up here. <laughs> Many of us know a lot about the famous people that we follow in their footsteps. You know, we all know about the Martins, the Nelsons. My personal most transformative, exciting moment in life was meeting Nelson Mandela. And I will forever be grateful because when I worked for Bill Clinton, and for his election, the only, they called and said, do you want to come to Washington? Do you want to come back? You were so you know, involved in Washington politics before you moved to California. And I said, no, I only want one thing. I've raised millions of dollars for you. I want to meet Nelson Mandela. <laughs> and Maggie Williams, who worked for Bill Clinton, called me and said, Nelson Mandela is coming to the White House. We would love you to join us and be at the dinner, which honestly, it made my life. That was like enough for me. I, this man was this presence in my life that you could be your highest self, you could go through hell, and you could still have grace in your eyes, joy in your heart, and be tough as nails. So I got, I got to meet my hero, and very few people really ever get that privilege and that blessing and that joy. And talk about someone who doesn't disappoint. This was a man who never disappointed on a first second. And I will just never forget, you know, by the time my event with him was over, I couldn't speak. I was just like, you would have thought I'd met Elvis Presley when I was 15 years old. I was like, I was hopeless. I was like, I cannot believe I was just with Nelson Mandela, right? <laughs> So we all know about those people, but a lot of you younger people might not know about the Wilmas, the Ellas, the Fannie Lou's, the Julians, the Johns, the people that aren't as famous. You don't, might not know Dolores Huerta, but you do know Cesar Chavez. But that's who everybody in this room who turned out for me is. You are those people, those foot soldiers in the absolute army seeking change that this country can be what it should be, what it's capable of being, what it's wealthy enough to provide to every single American. And that's who you are, and I am another foot soldier with you. We are not those brilliant names, but we are people putting one foot in front of the other, trying to be as strategic as we can, knowing to keep giving and even give a little more and that it's worth it. it. It's worth having a life of purpose and meaning. It, it, it means everything to be able to go to bed at night knowing that you are spending your day and your life trying to serve other people and help things be better for other people. I mean, it's better than any amount of money or any job because no one in my life, even though I've been on many different payrolls, no one really 
employed me for, it was like not a job. It was my life and I got paid to be me. And I just wish everybody could have that experience because it's rare and I must have been smart enough to figure out how to convince these people to pay me, so. Um, but, you know, it was so, such a privilege to be able to do that. Um, but like me, you all are also stubborn people, you know, and you won't take no. And some of us have been in prison. Friends of ours have lost their lives. Others have just volunteered. Many have registered voters, counted those ballots to make sure they were being counted honestly, made sure those people that turned out to vote were being counted. And now I know more about that than I ever wanted to know because my husband made a documentary on it and I went through hours and hours and hours of footage of people standing in lines and having their votes stolen. So I get it. But thank God there are people like you who are out there making sure those people's voices and votes are counted. I grew up a cultural Jew, not a very religious Jew, and one of my favorite people of faith is Jim Wallace, who said to me not too long ago, Marge, it's all about hope, and hope is believing in spite of evidence, and then watching the evidence change. So when I get depressed and wonder if change is possible, I think about all those previous struggles once thought by people in those times to be impossible. And I see the long way we've come and how far and how much more transformation is left to accomplish. But you will feel so good just knowing that you were that foot soldier in the army of social change. There are a few people here I want to personally acknowledge because you put up with me through a lot. My sister and college roommate, Marcy. My fabulous young daughter who chose to have me as her mom at the age of seven. My dear friends, Peter and Noel and dear Mary, who's no longer with us, for the magic that you brought into my life and for letting me go on that journey of, of, of sharing that magic with you as you took your spirit and your songs and your excitement to people as you healed people all over the world. And despite the fact that I can't carry a tune and sing off key and despite the fact that I dropped backstage a very expensive guitar uh, I mean, I wasn't being paid as a roadie. I was me, you know? <laughs> but for someone who loves folk music, it doesn't get any better than that. And that piece of my life is just emblazoned in my heart and soul and really has been the soundtrack of much of my life. Um, you will never know what those years in the 80s and our work together really, really did for me at a time in my life that was very difficult. To my friends from Vista who showed up tonight, um, thanks for being there for one of the most challenging and important years of my life. It's where I learned the most, but God, it was hard. <laughs> and thankfully I stayed out of jail and you kept me out of jail. It didn't keep me out of testifying in front of congressional hearings for 14 hours under oath, but I did obligate millions of federal dollars to young people throughout this country who were able to dedicate two years of their life to helping low-income people empower themselves. <laughs> to my ARCA clan and crew, um, if this is philanthropy, it's amazing because you were impactful, innovative, daring, risk-taking, and you make it fun. And I'm still there, and I started in 1981, but 
you know, I'll be there with my walker because I love it. Um, there's someone who's not here tonight, but who has been one of my biggest cheerleaders in life, and his spirit is here. He is not on this earth anymore, but so much of what I was able to do and so much of that I was able to do with all of you was because of the generosity and the love and the support of Smith Bagley. And on a personal level, and I have to say this, they even gave me my wet, Elizabeth and Smith gave me my wedding, and this gorgeous young woman, Vaughn, who's my goddaughter, was my flower girl. <laughs> so they were there, and the entire Bagley family has just been there for so many years in giving of their generosity, their love, their friendship, and their support. Um, to Janet for taking me to very dangerous places, not leaving me in war zones, and making sure that I got home safely, and then staying in my life to talk about everything all the time. Uh, to my extended California family, Marilyn, Alan, Kathy, I rely on them daily. And to two amazing young women, Rupa and Rachel. Rachel, my partner. <laughs> Rupa, who is the happening Hindu, she's fabulous. And she is like the person who makes me look good all the time. Um, thank you for helping me be the best me I could be in, in, in California. And everything we accomplished in the last years and decades is because you were doing it with me. Um, really, I love you as if you were family. Um, and to my clients who thankfully put their trust in me, to Barbara and Stephen and Katie and JJ and Andrew and Ellen and actually one of them's here, Monica and her husband Phil, for trusting me and my firm with your generosity and your philanthropy and your friendship. Um, it, it meant so much to me these last 26 years that my clients really got who I was and supported myself and Rupa and Rachel in doing what we believed should be done. To my newest colleagues at Cedar sinai Medical Center and to the most amazing rock star, Dr. Mers, uh, <laughs> If anybody needs a cardiologist, she's it. Um, by the way, I have no health problems. This is not about my personal heart situation. This is about the fact that I felt like I was literally living in a cave. All of a sudden, I start learning that more women die of heart disease than men. More women die of heart disease than all cancers combined. The media doesn't cover it. No one knows it. I go to five dinner parties in a row and start asking people if they know this, all with people who at least read the New York Times and often the Wall Street Journal. No one, they all think I'm crazy and making it up. And I got pissed because I then find out that research for nearly 50 years is being done, of course, on all men. And this epidemic is killing about four to 500,000 women a year, many within a year or two of their first incident, and nobody knows. And then I meet this team from Cedars that, are just, that have just made it their passion to move that rock and uncover this situation and begin to build a national campaign to bring this to the attention of women and their health issues all over the world. So it's exciting to be on this journey with you and to really feel like we are at the beginning pioneers when hopefully, just like the breast cancer champions did for us, we will be doing for the women that follow us. And even though this is not the Academy Awards where you're told you have to thank your husband, you know, um, I want to thank my husband because he puts a smile on my face every day, and damn it, he challenges me every day to be the best me I can be. And sometimes that's really hard, and I had to give up plastic bottles and all this stuff. But thank God that 
he does because it's never boring. I love you. <laughs> When I'm done, my hap I'm going to be happy because my I'm being indulged with like a few minutes of my favorite music. So I just want to stay, say before I leave this stage or whatever it is, and I am never doing this again, that, <laughs> that I think we're going to all be judged by a few questions. And as people look back at us, how we answered these questions is going to determine what they think. And one of those, a couple of those questions are, will we shape our future or will we be shaped by it? Will we build community or hide behind walls if we can afford to? Will we take the risks necessary for change to occur? And will we help those who need us so that they too can realize their dreams. And on a personal level, will we strive for balance? Not so good at that. But will we strive for balance that takes into account our spirit, our families, our communities, our country, our global reality, and our home, planet Earth, the place where all of us are connected to one another the place where we're all part of something so much bigger than ourselves and the place that is so fragile with the poison being pumped into the atmosphere. So I now understand what carbon is thanks to my husband and I understand what methane is, but I more than that in a wonky way want to say that we're poisoning the planet and it puts everything and everybody and every young person and their children in jeopardy and we have to stop. So, oh my God, I'm so glad this is over. So, <laughs> thank you for your commitment, for your friendship, for being here, for your support. And I don't know who comes next, but I'm excited because it's the music. Thank you, everybody.